Hello and welcome. It's Friday. You're tuned in to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. I've got a great show lineup for you. Listen, one of the the earliest memories I have regarding books mom would have laying around the house was The Ghost of Flight 401. And then I remember watching the movie with Ernest Borgnine and being thoroughly and completely freaked out. Although it was essentially a very good story about this ghost who would help um, other airlines and, and make his presence known on flights that might have a disaster go on. But there was something I can't put my finger on that was just chilling regarding the story. And I've tried for 13 seasons of this show to find a guest that could bring this story to us. And unfortunately, most of the people originally involved in this are no longer available or no longer want to speak on this. And I reached out to a good friend of mine who's very good at vetting out a story and getting to the details of this. He's our go-to and one of our favorite guests of all time. Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer and psychic explorer, the, uh, um, is a world-renowned fourth-generation science-based evidential psychic medium who communicates with spirits. He's featured regularly on major television shows such as CBS. Uh, the Doctors had, have had him on. He's been on Coast to Coast AM. He's been part of our world for about the last, I think, eight years. He's here with us today. Mark, thank you for joining us again. Thanks, Dave. And hey, what better story for Friday the 13th than this one? So I I really appreciate you having me on. Well, that's why I wanted for Friday the 13th. I wanted a cool story. I wanted something that kind of went back to the roots of part of my interest into the paranormal. And I remember mom reading this book and telling me how cool it was. And and you knew my mom. You had a chance to interact and be around her for many years while she was alive. And and um she, her fascination helped drive me into the want and desire to understand more about this field and her openness to this whole world of the strange and supernatural phenomena. So when the flight, uh, Ghost of Flight 401 kept at the back of my brain, I know, and for our listeners, I just want to let them know something about you and having you on as a guest. It's been remarkable. We've had a great opportunity over the years that when there's a topic I want to cover and I cannot find an expert on that topic, I have been able to reach out to you and and task you with the job of becoming the expert on that topic. And it's not just something that in a day or two he goes over the cursory notes. Mark will take the task on and then put me off 60 to 90 days before he's willing to do the interview regarding this because he wants to make sure he has the completely fleshed out story on this. And I really respect that because there are a lot of people who would just pop up uh, the Wikipedia page and sit there and read to me from that and, and, and try to fake their way through it. But Mark absorbs the story, becomes part of it. And um, that's been a, a, a great dynamic of our friendship on the show is watching you. And when I kind of, when I came to you and I said, you know what, Mark, do you know about this story? Would this be something you'd be willing to research and, and talk about how familiar were you with the story of the ghost of flight 401? Well, I remember seeing the movie when I was a kid, but, but I'll never forget. Um, we had a family friend and he was, um, he was a Marine and he was out of the Marines. My dad was a Navy SEAL. And, um, so he was a friend of my dad's and a friend of my older brother's. And when Flight 401 crashed in the Everglades, our friend Hugh was part of the team that went down to find body parts. And I remember, even though he was a, a battle-hardened Marine, he'd served in Vietnam, um, I remember he basically had a lot of, a lot of problems um, because they were finding heads. They were finding, I mean, dismembered body parts. And then, you know, the Everglades is full of all kinds of creepy crawlies. And so when they would find a body part or a body, there would be things eating it. And uh, he... he um, 
was really coping with some some major traumatic stress from this. So, you know, having lived in, in Florida, even though the crash was about 200 miles from where I live, I did have a family friend um, who was there at the scene. And so so this has always been a kind of a mystique and, and certainly a tremendous tragedy that has uh, affected all of us and, in, in a sense, my own family. When a tragedy befalls us like this, and, and especially, I mean, you were only a couple hundred miles away, were, were you real sensitive as a child? Well, I, you know, I, I, was a, I was a little boy at the time, and this really bothered me a lot. Um, because this was Eastern Airlines, and, and it, back then, you couldn't go anywhere in Florida without seeing Eastern Airlines. And some of my earliest memories were family vacations to the Caribbean and uh, down to Jamaica, all that were on Eastern Airlines. So it was terribly frightening. And uh, my mother, who was also a medium, and, and my dad as well, uh, yeah, this was this was a, a very, it sent a, uh, let's call it a, not only an emotional, but a psychic shockwave through us and was very very upsetting i remember my my mother was so distressed by this she was actually losing sleep for a couple days the reason i ask is you know i mean there's that great line in the original star wars movie when they blow up um alderaan and there's this kind of outreach across the universe right the people sensitive to the force said i you know i sense a great disturbance in the force meaning that they you know the sense of all of these people crying out as the end came i often wondered when there's a a traumatic experience like that um some of these uh, random number generators around the world will start picking up on it sometimes hours before the event actually takes place and I wonder, do mediums like yourself, do you notice this ripple effect as well, even though you may not have been in or you know near New York City at the time when 9-11 happened? Was there kind of a shockwave of, of energy that you guys were able to find this disturbance in the force that hit you before you even knew it was coming? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In in both my books, I, I chronicle things like this that happened to both myself and to my mother. Um, and it is, it's, it's a great disruption in the force. And I'm not being facetious when I say that. And more recently, I was in, um, a couple of years ago, I was uh, at the Spirit Symposium in Sedona. And uh, I was giving this presentation in Arizona. I was doing a mediumship demonstration, Dave. And all of a sudden, all I kept seeing was Orlando. And I kept calling on people and I'm going, is there some connection with you in Orlando? No. And Orlando, no. Everything was Orlando. Or- Orlando, Orlando, and and I couldn't understand it, so I said, all right, we'll just put that off to the side, and I continued making connections for audience members. When I got back to my hotel room, I turned on the TV, and I'm horrified to see that the Pulse nightclub shooting was going on, and nobody in, in Sedona in that room had a connection to Orlando um, but I was picking up on some very disturbing thing in Orlando and this is not the first time that uh, this has happened with me. It, it happened with me uh, with the Paris nightclub um, uh, the, the terrorism um, it happened with me um, something in Nice, France and these are documented that this comes up during readings um, because um, um you know, it's as people are observing me doing this. So, what I believe is happening is, in you know, we can we can uh, make jokes and all that about uh, Star Wars, but um, a lot of people don't realize George Lucas, when he was 16 years old, was in a terrible car accident, and he actually was pronounced dead en route to the emergency room. And then when they brought him into the hospital, all of a sudden he comes back. George Lucas had a near-death experience, and he went into the light, and he encountered light beings, relatives, a uh, very, very typical phenomenon associated with a near-death experience. And 
where do you think he got the idea of the force, an energy that connects and binds everyone? And also, it's not unusual for people that have a near-death experience to have increased psychic um, activity and also a sense of interconnectedness. Interconnectedness meaning that on an energetic level, we are all connected. Now, as woohoo as that may sound, and, and we've done this... Um, um, both on Darkness Radio and on Coast to Coast, where I talk about quantum consciousness and how everything on a subatomic level is is made up of electromagnetic energy. But let's bring it, Dave, into into a more relatable fashion. You're a parent, okay? You ever just been doing something and all of a sudden had a feeling something was going wrong with one of your kids? Yet they weren't on the cell phone telling you this, or you had no direct observation. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've had that end with my mom. <laughs> exactly, and I bet all the listeners that are out there have had that with their children or with family members, um, or you start thinking about a friend, and it's not always a, a you know a negative thing. It could be you're sitting there thinking, "Gee, I haven't thought about Jane in a while," and all of a sudden the phone rings, and oh my gosh, it's Jane, because. This is an example of what I call frequency beacons and how we're energetically interconnected and we pick up on these impulses. Now, with people that are, are more developed in, in uh, psychic and mediumistic uh, areas, we tend to, to pick it up to a greater extent. But everyone is capable of experiencing this. And that's why um, people will think, oh, my gosh, something's going on with my, my little boy or, or my, my mother or somebody like that. And then you find out that it's true. This is not hocus pocus. This is not woohoo. This is a real thing. These are ripples. These are impulses flowing through this electromagnetic energy that connects everything. Ergo, George Lucas's The Force. Very cool. Well, let's let's start to talk about this case and maybe bring us up to speed. When, when this all starts with a horrific plane crash, and what year did this take place? This was um, uh, December twenty ninth, nineteen seventy two, and there was a Eastern Airlines flight four hundred one, and it was on one of the uh, TriStar L ten elevens. It was uh, the L ten eleven was one of the newest uh, aircraft made by Lockheed, which is now Lockheed Martin. But Lockheed has been in in business making aircraft, and this was one of the newest, best um, airplanes out there. Uh, Eastern Airlines, you know, this was the pride of their fleet and the the crew and the passengers were all looking forward to spending new year's in miami so there's a flight from jfk to miami so flight 401 everything's just just fine until they start approaching miami and the um the flight crew it consisted of of three men captain bob loft first officer john albert uh, Stockstill, they called him Bert Stockstill, and the flight engineer Don Repo, and then I believe they had um, ten ten flight attendants on board. So everything's going fine, and uh, they've radioed to Miami. Miami says you're cleared for landing, and so the captain um, pulls the lever to bring down the landing gear, and. There's a, a green light that's supposed to come on to say that the front nose cone landing gear has come down, and the light didn't illuminate. And the pilot's like, something's going on here. And the first officer's looking at it, and they're like, okay, we can't tell if the uh, – because you can't just look out the window of, of a cockpit and see if the, the landing gear underneath it has come down. So um, the they, So they radioed Miami and said, okay, we're going to circle Miami. Until we get this straightened out. Miami's like, okay, great. So the initial thought is from the uh, flight engineer, Don Repo, is like, well, maybe maybe um, uh, the bulbs, uh, they're not placed right in the socket. So he pulls out the, the socket and he puts it back in and still the lights are not indicating that the – Landing gear is down. So then he climbs down into what they call the hell hole. Okay, that's the avionics bay, which is right below the cockpit. So he climbs down there to see if he can get a visual on it. Well, it's pitch dark in there. It was also a new moon, and they were now circling over the Everglades. 
and they couldn't see what was going on. And so then the first officer is down there trying to help him, and they couldn't get a visual on it. And so the captain says, well, i got to get into this too. So he switches on the autopilot. So the plane is supposed to be cruising at 2,000 feet in a circular pattern on autopilot. Well, they still couldn't get the lights to come on to indicate whether or not the landing gear had come down. And so here is where everything goes goes bad. The pilot, this is based on conjecture and study by the FAA, uh, the Federal Aviation Administration, and the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board. It appears the pilot turned to speak to the first officer who was in turn speaking to the flight engineer in a darkened cockpit. And when he turned, his knee hit the yoke, which disengaged the autopilot. So now they're talking, and Miami radios in, hey, is everything okay? But the air traffic controller in Miami, who noticed that they went from 2,000 feet suddenly down to 900 feet, Ooh. didn't say, hey, what's up with the 1,100-foot altitude change? Did not say that. And because it was so dark over the Everglades, the crew, the captain and the first officer, did not have a point of reference. In other words, if they are flying over Miami, they would notice, oh, my gosh, we're getting really close to the ground. And then in the, the last few moments of the flight recorder, there's a, hey, what's going on here? And that's when they realized they were only 900 feet above the ground, and then the plane uh, nosedived right into the Everglades. And apparently it hit left side first, tearing off the left wing, impacting, and essentially the the aircraft, uh, Flight 401, the L-1011, essentially disintegrated on impact. But here's what's so incredible, Dave. A lot of people survived this. I mean, there were um, several several people who did die, but there were um, 94 people died, but 67 passengers survived. The flight um, uh, first officer was killed on impact. The captain survived but died during rescue operations, as did Don Repo, um, the um, – the flight engineer. Um, most of the uh, the uh, flight attendants uh, were killed as well. And almost immediately, despite the fact that this was in the Everglades, essentially in the middle of nowhere, uh, rescue teams were on the scene right away. So that is what the FAA and the NTSB have reconstructed, what was going on in, in the last moments. And if I could, it appears um, there may be four areas that caused this crash. One was subtle incapacitation of the pilot. A postmortem of his body indicated that the pilot had a really large brain tumor. And the discussion by the neurologist and by the coroner was could this brain tumor have caused issues with his peripheral vision, which would have made him unable to notice the sharp altitude decline on the airplane? Now, the family members and close friends of the pilot were interviewed, and everybody said he seemed to be fine, and there were no objective indications of peripheral vision loss. So the conclusion by the FAA was that did not contribute. Then what about the autopilot system? Well, the autopilot system functioned properly. However, it was inadvertently disengaged when the pilot turn to talk to the engineer. The next area of concern or causation was flight crew training. They said that based on Eastern Airline guidelines, the flight crew was properly trained, but not to the extent that they should have been. So they can't really rule that flight crew training was contributory to the crash. However, well, can, can I ask one thing though, Mark? Doesn't yeah. it seem strange? Okay, I understand you don't realize that you've disengaged the autopilot. Right. 
you're, it's dark, there's no lighted point of reference, you're flying over the Everglades, it's a slow, steady descent as you're coming down. But aren't there dials, the altimeter, and different things on the dashboard? I, I'm not sure what the proper terminology is for airplanes, but dashboard. It's a dashboard, yeah. <laughs> right. Wouldn't wouldn't the dashboard altimeter and other things have started to alert you to the fact that you're you're descending and that you're you know at what height you are? This crash changed all of that because once in in the the last uh, area um, is flight crew distractions which it will answer your question it was the crew was distracted and if they had been watching the instruments they would have seen like you said the altimeter showing going from 2000 feet suddenly to 900 feet and because of crash 401 and the report that came out from the FT- FAA and the NTSB um, and Lockheed immediately and all the other airline manufacturers immediately changed all this. Now, um, flashlights have become standard equipment in the cockpit. Gee, who, who would have thought? <laughs> Shoulder harnesses for flight attendants, okay, because that's why you know, most of them were killed. And acoustic alerts for change in autopilot settings. So now if the autopilot goes off, it'll go like ding, 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 or autopilot is disengaged. Autopilot is disengaged. They didn't have that back then. And the thing is, Dave, you and I, we live in a, a time when if you leave your car door open or, or your keys are still in the ignition, right. we get dings and buzzes. Well, guess what? Back then, they didn't have things like that. But this is what changed everything. And then this also started a whole whole movement in the airline industry and requirements rather for cockpit management so back then i mean you know this is 1970s and yeah th- this was an experienced pilot i mean this was an experienced crew and they're on one of the best aircraft available but it did not have warning indicators um acoustic indicators that you and i take for granted and guess what they found in the examination of the crash the flight, the landing gear was down. The problem is the two bulbs had burned out. They oh. couldn't even tell that these two bulbs were burned out. And that's why you can't just rely on a flashing light. You have to have a secondary backup system. And I remember my dad, um, who was a NASA engineer, he was talking about one of the advantages, at least back then, the, the United States had over the Soviet Union space program, is that we would have a number of backup systems and alerts, and that we, our electronics um, could be much smaller and compact, and the Russians were using larger and bulkier things, so they would have a primary system and not a backup system, whereas the U.S. would have a primary, a backup, and then, like, you know, another backup. So Flight 401's crash, as horrible and as tragic as it was, laid the groundwork for improved safety standards and um, warning light and auto and, and uh, acoustic indicators in aircraft. I guess there has to be a starting point for everything, right? That that unfortunately was it. Uh, what a tragedy to happen in well, order for ti- that to, to occur. Absolutely. Well, the Titanic, okay, when the Titanic went down, there were not enough lifeboats for the passengers because the um, the uh, the designers of the ship felt that all the lifeboats – um, obstructed the passengers' view of the ocean, and it was unsightly. I mean, that was so British. It was very unsightly. <laughs> but because the Titanic went down, it became a naval requirement on all ships that there has to be enough boats, lifeboats, for every single person on board. So apparently it takes a disaster before common sense seems to kick in. What a shame. Brutal. Our guest today is Mark Anthony. He's the author of two award-winning books, Evidence of Eternity, Communicating with Spirits for Proof of the Afterlife is one of his books. And uh, we'll have links up to his website and to his books. And I do want to mention, um, Mark, to uh, draw attention to your Facebook page, because in the investigation of this case that we're covering of the ghost of Flight 401, you uncovered a lot of photographs and images, so you're going to put together a slideshow that will be available on the page tomorrow, correct? Or, or today, Absolutely. I should say. 
Well, absolutely, because I think it's important um, for people to see a lot of these photographs. Plus, they're going to tie into what we're going to be talking about shortly. Excellent. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get back to the story. So here, all of these uh, drastic things went wrong. It was it was one of those cases of Murphy's Law, right? Anything and everything that could go wrong did go wrong for this crew. And how many people were on, on board this flight total? Do you know? Um, I do. There were um, 10 flight attendants, 163 passengers, and three in the flight crew. So that's 173, 176 people, 94 died. Wow, so 94 died. Okay, 94 died, and this is still considered one of the worst um, aviation disasters in U.S. history. Um, a, a terrible tragedy that never should have happened, and it came down to two little tiny light bulbs were burned out. Mm. All right. Well, that's that's tragedy enough. This plane goes down in the Everglades. As you said, they quickly went out there and were able to start the recovery efforts, and they found people. Boy, the Everglades. Could you think of a creepier, more horrific place for your plane to go down than snake, alligator-infested waters and area in in the Everglades? What kind of nightmare was it for the recovery on that? Oh, it was terrible. Um, I've spent a lot of time, you know, being in Florida, and, and plus, um, one of the things I like to do is, is hiking through rainforests, and I've I've hiked through jungles in Central South America, Southeast Asia, the Caribbean, and certainly in the in the Everglades. And oh, it's it's there's a lot of poisonous snakes. You got water moccasins, you got rattlesnakes, you got coral snakes, uh, just just to name a few. Then of course there's all the dangerous insects. Um, Alligators, uh, for the most part, will avoid you, but not always. And then, and then there's uh, the, the massive amounts of mosquitoes and these other insects that we call noceums and horseflies, um, in addition to the poisonous spiders and scorpions that are there. Now, because it was December, it would not have been as oppressively hot as it would be uh, for most of the other year. But the other um, thing is that... Uh, the ground is marshy, if not underwater. Um, but one of the, the the reasons so many people did survive is because when the, the plane went down and the left wing uh, seemed to impact, because it was a soft surface, um, it, it hit the, uh, the ground. Um, the debris field was over 1,600 feet long by 300 feet wide. So it was a football, feet, uh, football field wide and over five football fields long. That was the debris field. If it had been, uh, let's say, a rocky or a hard surface, probably everyone would have died. And also the construction of the airplane was so good that the, the people who did live, it's because um, not only were they seat belted in, but their seats were very heavily bolted uh, down. So that's why – and some people just actually got up and walked away. There was others with severe um, orthopedic injuries. Uh, so everything about this flight is is highly unusual and, and extremely bizarre. The way that this happened, too, with all of those deaths involved and, and- – I mean, it, is it a surprise to you that there were as many survivors of this crash as there were? Uh, absolutely. I mean, see, in my work as a personal injury attorney, I have worked on, on so many crash uh, cases, and I'm certainly familiar with examining accident investigation reports. But to see an aircraft go down now, it was estimated that it was traveling at 200 miles per hour, and it went from 900 feet um, hitting the ground at 200 miles per hour. Okay, I don't really think I'd want to be in any vehicle that was going 200 miles per hour when it it, it impacted with the ground. And um, it is just astonishing that as many people did survive uh, as, as as there were. I want to get into the the paranormal aspect of that, and I know we're we're getting close to that as part of the story, and we'll do that probably after the theater of the mind coming up in just a few moments. But um, with this, you know, uh, the crash and all the changes that were made and put into place, thankfully, due to this crash, um, I was surprised, I guess, to find out that they reclaim 
parts of the the plane. I know that they've always done that to try to rebuild and reconstruct the plane to find out where things went wrong, what happened. But I had no idea, Mark. And were you surprised that they would repurpose parts from a crashed plane into other planes? Well, here's where, yes, this definitely is opening the door to the paranormal aspect of, of this, uh, of this story. According to, um, John Fuller, who wrote the book, The Ghosts of Flight 401, he claims that several parts of the L-1011, uh, that were not damaged were, as Dave said, repurposed, reused, and incorporated into other um, planes in the Eastern Airlines fleet. Now, why would they do that? Uh, number one, this was a relatively new aircraft. In fact, it was it was essentially brand spanking new, and there were not a lot of spare parts yet available. And so, um, the things that could work allegedly were incorporated and put into other other Lockheed um, L1011s. Um, it's not unusual uh, to salvage parts from ships or, or cars. I mean, go to a junkyard. Hey, I need a new uh, a water pump for my car. And, you know, your car is 10 years old, and they have a, a, a comparable model, and there's nothing wrong with the water pump. So that's not an unusual thing. But the allegation here is that parts from Flight 401 from the TriStar L-1011 were then incorporated into other L-1011s in the Eastern Airlines fleet. Prior to this happening, was there any kind of strange activity that took place um, around the crash site that you're aware of, anything at all paranormal? Not at the crash site. All the paranormal things seem to start happening on other flights. Um, in fact, um, the the legend or or the the mystique, the story, is that on other Eastern Airlines flights that were using repurposed parts from the uh, Flight 401 crash paranormal activity began to occur and sightings of spirits and um and pretty intense uh experiences were being documented supposedly by not only passengers but by flight crew and even an eastern airlines vice president on one flight All right, we're going to get into that and so much more. Our guest today is Mark Anthony, and you can check out his website, evidenceofeternity.com. And if you're interested in getting a personal reading with Mark, he is one of the best mediums I've ever had the opportunity to come into contact with. And there's information on his website, also information on how to get his books and follow up with where he will be doing live presentations and talks all around the world. So make sure you check that out for yourself. But right now, it's time for the brand new edition of theater of the mind this week it's a double header from the personal files of dark hives dave himself with a little help from my pretty friends it was the fall of 1988 and my roommates at winona state decided it was time for me to get out of the house and make some new friends i hadn't ventured out with the exception of maybe going to class from time to time get a hobby dave meet new friends My best friend Paul insisted. I thought I was a hermit, Dave. You need to get a life. Red directed. With that, I set out to stroll the campus to meet new people and find something to occupy my time when I wasn't in class. We lived, conveniently enough, directly across from campus in what would become a legendary party house by the end of the year. I strode out the front door. The heavy old wooden door cried out in a creaky manner as it swung open, then quickly slammed shut as I walked across our freshly mowed lawn, narrowly escaping a few well-placed poop mines from our evil three-legged dog patches. I crossed the street and thus began my journey. Shortly after I crossed the street, a very cute little blonde in short shorts and a ponytail meandered across my path. I decided this could be my new best friend and decided to follow her, for she surely would know all the cool places for us beautiful people to hang out. We wound through the sidewalks and past the buildings until we approached the Performing Arts Center of Winona State University. Hmm, performing arts, I thought to myself. I like performing and the arts 
and blondes, my mind continued. I had been a part of quite a few community theater plays in Roselle, Illinois, and decided I'd like to continue my stock, uh, my pursuit of my future Mrs. Schrader and see where this would lead. I followed her through the busy halls, which were filled with hundreds of busy conversations, up the stairs, down another hall, and then watched as my dream girl finally reached her destination. She faced the door, grabbed the handle, and made her way into the room. I picked up my pace to see what our final destination would be. And to my utter astonishment, it was the door to the campus radio station. KQAL 89.5, your radio alternative. And there it hung prominently on the door, a sign that stated, KQAL is currently seeking student on-air talent for all positions. Apply inside. I had dreamt of being a radio DJ since I could remember. Whether it was recording with my oldest and best friend Rick in his parents' garage telling stories as the Hardy Boys or introducing Elvis, Beatles, or Monkey songs as Slick Rick and Dave the Wave. This is Slick Rick and Dave the Wave with the latest from the Beatles. I want to hold your hand. <laughs> <laughs> to making calls to my favorite on-air talent of the time, Larry Lujak of WLS or Roy Leonard of WGN, to pick their brains about radio. I knew that would always be my dream job. So, with a deep, slow breath, I reached for the doorknob to face my destiny. Get my dream girl and my dream job. I entered the busy newsroom and was met by a congenial young man that held the position of program director. He reached his hand out and met me with a million gigawatt smile. Hi, I'm Howard Joseph. Welcome to KQAL. He said. We exchanged pleasantries. All the while, my eyes darted around the room, looking for my prey, uh, uh, muse. Where had she gone? After a few more minutes of talking, I was invited back to begin training the following day. With that, I looked Howard in the eyes and said, Hey, I, uh, I followed a very attractive blonde up here. Do you know where she went? He shook his head and assured me no one had come in prior to entering the room. And as I could see, the other two rooms were busy with on-air activity, and there was no way out except through the door that we walked in through and we were standing right in front of. I walked out a bit puzzled, but amused that my love for the ladies led me directly into the path of the oncoming storm that was my future. All it took was an 80s blonde with a ponytail and pink shirt and white short shorts to give me the kick in the ass I so richly needed. I never saw her again, never in all those years that followed at Winona State University. And trust me, I looked. Fast forward about eight months, and I was heading home to Illinois to visit my family for a few days before heading back to my new home in Minnesota. I'm not a fan of long car rides. Never have been, never will be. I was facing a doozy, about a five to six hour drive depending on traffic. Somewhere around La Crosse, Wisconsin, I met up with about four other cars speeding down the road. We formed a bit of a sloppy convoy, and I noticed all our license plates read Illinois. So, I knew we were in for the long haul. We never spoke a word, but would alternate turns taking point and rear of the pack. We reached speeds at times of 80 to 85 miles per hour. I guess we thought there was safety in numbers, and it seemed to be working. After a good three hours on the road, one of the cars in our convoy pulled alongside me. A very attractive girl in a small muscle car. She shot me a smile and motioned toward the coming exit. I was caught between a rock and a hard place, do I leave my fellow speeders for a tete-a-tete -tete with my new love interest, or continue playing follow the leader until I reach the border of Illinois? Well, I was young and hormones spoke louder than logic, so I nodded to the seductive siren waving me off course. With a wave and a nod to my fellow speed demons, I slid into the right lane behind my temptress, and off we went to begin what was sure to be a fairy book love story. Once we left the interstate, she sped through the light, and I sadly was caught by the red light as it turned quickly after she passed through the intersection. From my vantage point, I could see two gas stations and the raised, magical, golden arches of fate ahead. The light turned, and I sped off to find my Juliet. I cruised slowly through the parking lot of the gas station and McDonald's in search of my elusive mistress, but she was nowhere to be found. I crossed the road and slowly proceeded through the parking lot of the Quick Trip and of the King of Burgers parking lot, but alas, love had dealt me a cruel blow. She was nowhere to be found. I drove up the road a bit to see if perhaps she had opted for a location with finer fare, but again, she was nowhere to be found. 
Oh, cruel fates, how you mock me, I cried out in desperation and in pain. Okay, maybe I didn't, but I'm sure I thought of something equally poetic. After exhausting my possibilities, I settled for a visit to the home of the Whopper and ate. Although the bitter taste of disappointment tainted my enjoyment of this freshly grilled delicacy, I limped off like a wounded dog back to the interstate to travel the road alone. Like David Banner from the Incredible Hulk TV show, I was destined to wander the highways and byways alone. A lone hero on a journey of solitude. Okay, well, maybe all these years have skewed my memory and perspective, but you have to enjoy the dramatics of it all. After a lonely 45-minute drive, I was met with a tremendous backup on the highway. Traffic was at a standstill. I was getting more cranky by the minute. Had I stayed with my crew in the first place, I would almost be home by now. No, no, my libido and lack of common sense had to cause me to stray. Well, that and the come-hither look of a pretty woman. After what seemed like an eternity, I slowly inched my way up the road, only to find that a huge, and I mean huge, accident had occurred earlier. The wreckage had been pushed to the side of the road. Police and firemen and road workers had helped move it out of the way. There had been a jackknife truck that skidded across the highway. And there, among the twisted, burned-out wreckage, were the cars that I had been locked in a convoy brotherhood with since the start of my journey. I surveyed the damage, and my skin crawled at the severe damage that had been done to those vehicles. I couldn't imagine how anyone had survived that kind of devastation. The rest of my ride home was spent in silent contemplation. When I got home, I crumbled into my loving mother's arms and told her of my journey. She comforted me and thanked God that I had followed that girl instead of the guys I had been speeding with. I was haunted by the mortality of the situation and horrific outcome my comrades had had delivered unto them. I reminded my mom about the angel encounter that I had had on that same stretch of highway ten months earlier, then described to her the pretty blonde that introduced me to KQAL and the stunning brunette that led me to safety that very day. Both dream girls that vanished once their jobs had been accomplished. The outcomes of both stories ended well for me, but my dream girl got away. My mom just put her arms around me and said, Don't worry. She's out there, and you're going to find her. She was right, of course. It only took me another 30 years, but it was well worth the wait. So thanks to the angels, the spirits, the well-wishers and magical imps that intervene daily on my behalf, thank you for this life that I lead and the past that I cherish. And most of all, thank you for the future that you have assured me. Welcome back. This is Beyond the Darkness, your home for the best in paranormal talk radio on a freaky Friday, the ghost of Flight 401. Our guest today, Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer, is here with us. He's the author of Evidence of Eternity, Communicating with Spirits for Proof of the Afterlife. We'll have a link up to his book. We'll also have a link up to the book of the ghost of Flight 401. All you have to do is go to darknessradio.com, click on the Killer Deals link. And that will access all of the books that you hear covered on this show. So make sure that you go check that out for yourself right now. All right, Mark, let's uh, let's get into this. We've got this horrific plane crash. We've got ni- over 90 people have perished in this plane crash. And they start repurposing parts of this plane to other planes in their system. So they've got spare parts around. How quickly after this crash, did strange paranormal phenomena begin to spring up? Well, according to the the ghosty legends, um, the following year, 1973, people started spotting um, spirits on other planes. And what's fascinating is the two spirits in particular, that of Captain Bob Loft and engineer Don Repo, according to witnesses, over 20 times that were they sighted on other um, other Eastern Airlines 
uh, L-1011s that were using parts harvested from the crash of Flight 401. And what's fascinating is that um, Don Repo is kind of seen a little bit more, quite a bit more. And um, one of my favorite, one of my favorite stories in this is a flight attendant. Her name was Faye Merriweather, and the flight was from, I guess it was from JFK to Mexico City. And supposedly the galley, the, the kitchen area of the plane, um, had been taken from Flight 401. And so Faye Merriweather, this is back when, you know, airlines actually used to feed you a meal on a plane. Um, she opened up the oven and she saw a face looking at her and she freaked out. So she went and she got another flight attendant and the flight engineer who recognized the face as Don Repo. And uh, the, the apparition spoke to them and said, watch out for a fire on this plane. Well, she was pretty unnerved by this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? No be. kidding. Yeah. I know you open up an oven and there's a dead guy's face looking at it saying, watch out for fire on the plane. Well, you could pass this off as a bunch of hooey and, and that, uh, this is all, you know, uh, you know, phony, except for the fact that the plane lands in Mexico City, okay, and then on the return leg from Mexico City back to, to the States, um, the flight, the plane is cleared for, for takeoff, but then all of a sudden, uh, one of the engines begins backfiring and fails, and so they, they return, uh, to, to the airport, and the, the engine bursts on, into flames. So, pun intended, uh, news of ghost stories spread like wildfire throughout Eastern Airlines. And, well, then, what's really uh, kind of intriguing, too, about the story, is this flight attendant that opened the oven sees this face, right? Goes and gets other people who also come back and see the face. And these other people weren't familiar with who this was. It was one of the engineers that recognized the person. So it wasn't even predisposed to see something that might not actually be there or kind of a group hallucination of, of a friend that may have perished on one of these planes. Most of the people that witnessed that paranormal encounter had never seen him and had no idea who it was exactly and there was one passenger who said that she was sitting in her seat and it looked like the captain of the plane sat next to her um, and was non-responsive and ashen and looked ill and she was trying to talk to him all of a sudden he just disappeared and so she started screaming and they said according to uh, the reports that i read that it took several of the flight attendants to hold her down i mean she just basically came unglued um i guess most people would if you're sitting there talking to somebody that looks very ill who's in a uniform that should be the pilot of the airplane and then they disintegrate right in front of you uh i would assume that would be un to me i would think it was cool and i'd try to communicate with the spirit but then again most people don't engage in spirit contact on a daily basis right right okay uh yeah that, that would be a little uh freaky I, and i'll tell you what mark I was terrified of flying for a long time after seeing that movie because I was a kid. And not because I was afraid the plane would crash. I wanted an aisle seat where every kid wanted a window seat so they could look out. I didn't want to see the reflection because some of the people were claiming they would see him reflected in the windows of the plane. And that just utterly messed with my brain. I will be honest with you, until I was probably about 16 years old, I did not like going on flights because that's all I had in my mind. Oh, sure. Well, apparently the spirit of Don Repo um, was was rather hyperactive. Uh, he appeared, um, there was a, a flight, a group of flight engineers. Um, they were getting ready to do the pre-flight, and according to the stories, is... Another flight engineer came up to them and said, you don't have to do worry about the pre-flight. I've already done it. And then d the apparition disappeared, and the flight engineers recognized him as Don Repo. So on another flight, an Eastern Airlines vice president sat down. He was in first class, and he started talking to the uniformed officer next to him, who disappeared, and he said, dear God, that was Bob Loft. 
So now we're getting vice presidents from Eastern Airlines. We're getting engineers. We're getting passengers. Start seeing Don Repo all over the place. One of the coolest sightings is one one uh, flight crew member was talking to uh, whom they recognized to be Captain Bob Loft, who had died on Flight 401. He said that there'll never be another crash on an L-1011. We won't let it happen. So the question now becomes... Are these are these accounts accurate? Are they verifiable? Are they credible? And if so, are spirits intervening to help prevent another tragedy? Are spirits now becoming actively involved, if not invested, in preventing another type of tragedy. So this sets off a whole lot of paranormal and spiritual and philosophical questions. And certainly these rumors spread throughout Eastern Airlines. However, the the guy, John Fuller, he wrote The Ghost of Flight 401. He claims that he interviewed dozens of Eastern Airline personnel who said this and that they insisted he use uh, pseudonyms, false names, in his book because Eastern Airlines was claiming that they were going to sue um, him for for conducting this investigation and writing the book. And also Eastern Airlines basically said anyone who starts spreading ghost stories will be immediately fired. So the question then is, did Eastern Airlines know about the ghost stories or was this an urban legend that Eastern was trying to put the kibosh on? You'd almost seem like, hey, this is kind of good press, too, if we you know, claim that we're putting the lid on ghost stories, but that they're promising that there'll never be another crash of this kind of plane again. You know, that kind of – is that putting uh, kind of this sense of calm back into the minds of people that, hey, we don't have to worry. Uh, you know, I mean, we're being watched out for from the spirit world. I, I wonder if there was any kind of logic associated with that. Well – it's it's hard to say, um, but we got to look at Eastern Airlines. It has a rather fascinating history. Um, it was founded in the 1930s, around 1935, by Eddie Rickenbacker, um, who was a World War One um, uh, flying ace. And at the time of the Flight 401 crash, Eastern Airline was under the leadership of Apollo astronaut or former Apollo astronaut Frank Borman. And um, a guy named Robert Sorling wrote a book, From the Captain to the Colonel, which was the history of Eastern Airlines, from Captain Eddie Rickenbacker up to Colonel Frank Borman. And Borman uh, was quoted as saying the ghost stories were garbage. Uh, Sorling interviewed... Um, John Ashcock, one of the Eastern uh, vice presidents, he called the whole story a bunch of crap. <laughs> so so um, Borman and uh, the Eastern board sat down and decided that they wanted to sue John Fuller for writing The Ghost of Flight 401, which then came out in 1976. And by this time, the ghost stories were still circulating. But Frank Borman made the decision, if we sue John Fuller, All we're going to do is generate massive amounts of publicity for his book. So Eastern, at least that's the the official story, decided not to sue the author of The Ghost Flight of 401 in order to avoid unnecessary publicity. Interesting. All right. Well, that's one tact to take. But what I find kind of uh, strange, I don't know where you fall on the idea of cursed objects. But it does seem interesting that these ghosts kept appearing on other flights, warning them of something impending, something bad that was going to happen on board that flight. And each one of them had repurposed parts from Flight 401. Do you believe that the Flight 401 pieces were stigmatized? That's what was causing the problems on board these flights? Well, 
in in a normal paranormal in a normal paranormal discussion, <laughs> right. which you and I have all the time. Normally, you know, for us the paranormal is normal, but uh, in in a typical paranormal uh, discussion, you can talk about a cursed object. Perhaps the most famous would be the Hope Diamond. Okay, whoever possesses the Hope Diamond seems to die of of horrible tragedies. I've seen it a couple times. It's at the Smithsonian in Washington, and I always go up to look at it, but I've always got this uh, I look at it or not, you know, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> Um, but maybe these were blessed parts because there was this terrible tragedy, and now these parts are repurposed, and these spirits show up to say, hey, don't worry, I've done their pre-flight. Hey, this plane, watch out for fire. Hey, we will never allow another crash on an L-1011. So are these negative messages being transmitted from the other side, or are they positive? And, you know... Um, I would have to argue that these would be blessed parts as opposed to being cursed parts because in all of these um, circumstances, the spirits are coming through telling or, or warning of potential problems or reinsuring or assuring people that there is no problem with the plane. So this is kind of the, the flip side to what you and I normally encounter when we get with cursed objects. Or maybe we should say that the vibration of these uh, repurposed parts from Flight 401 carry the energy of the people who, because of their distractions, cause the crash and maybe part of their spiritual karma um, is to prevent such a tragedy occurring again and that that's one position that we could take and I, yeah I get that and and there's that possibility I guess that's kind of the chicken and the egg scenario again right what came first is is the ghost making themselves known because of the repurposed parts uh, at being jinxed or are they like you said are they the blessing and helping to make sure that these flights go uh go off how long did the paranormal encounters take place that he was able to keep um records of and and how many encounters total did he end up collecting um well 20 that were aware of and then all of a sudden um by by the mid 70s According to urban legend and according to John Fuller, then Eastern um, removed all the parts from the all the repurposed parts from the L ten elevens um, that were having uh, you know spiritual sightings, particularly of Captain Bob Loft and engineer Don Repo. Um, but there's another side to this. Um, well, the Flight Safety Foundation, and I have not found this report, uh, so I'm giving hearsay right here. And hearsay is I'm repeating something that somebody else has written, but I can't find the particular report. Supposedly, according to John Fuller, the Flight Safety Foundation said the reports of, of the, the the spirits of uh, Captain Loft and uh, Engineer Repo appearing on the repurposed uh, parts on the other eastern uh, flights – the reports were given by experienced and trustworthy pilots, and we consider them significant. However, I started investigating the FAA and the NTSB reports, and I found nothing here that indicates that any of the parts from Flight 401 had been repurposed. And according to um, the skeptoid, a guy named Brian Dunning, uh, he wrote an article, said uh, the grounding of Ghost Flight 401. He said that there is absolutely no proof that any of the uh, parts were repurposed. And he said that back in the 1970s, there, the, Google didn't exist. You could say whatever you wanted, and nobody could verify it. But if you Google Flight 401 now, and you see the wreckage from the plane and how badly it was damaged, there is no way a galley an entire galley with a working oven could have been salvaged from that. And, and that's part of the slideshow that I'm going to be putting up uh, today on my Facebook page is to show you the evidence that I have found. And I 
and 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 I tend to be very very uh, cautious when reading things that skeptics write because they always seem to have a very negative viewpoint. But he makes a lot of good points. How in the world would you repurpose parts that were mangled and horribly damaged? And I cannot find, and my research has been been intense, but that doesn't mean I haven't missed something, but I cannot find any credible source that says that parts from the 401, Flight 401 crash were repurposed and implemented into other L-1011s in the Eastern uh, Fleet. So back in the 1970s, you could say this and, and say, oh, yeah, uh, the elevator survived, uh, the galley survived, these parts survived, and they were used, but there would be no way to verify that back then. You could say whatever you wanted. And this was part of the reason that Frank Borman, the head of Eastern Airlines, wanted to sue John Fuller because he was making these unsubstantiated, undocumented uh, claims and also saying that he interviewed people but he couldn't use their names. But that's why they made the decision that, well, if we do that and sue him, all that's going to do is make his book an even better bestseller than it was. And heck, two movies came out of it. And we're still talking about it 40 years later. But on the other scale, right, and, and coming from a skeptical believer's uh, sense and sensibility, it does seem that they would probably not promote the fact that they were repurposing parts from a, a downed plane because people are so superstitious. And if you don't believe me, there are still millions of hotels across the globe that refuse to have a 13th floor. They go from 12 to 14. That doesn't mean the 14th floor is any less 13th floor, but they refuse to number it as such. And that's kind of an interesting aspect as we talk today on Friday the 13th. So if you were a major corporation, would you publicly admit that you're using parts from a plane that broke down, whether it's just the galley, which has nothing to do with the interworkings of the plane, but there is that sense of, bad luck there is that sense of foreboding and doom attached to it i don't know that you would ever find papers unless you were privy to the the paperwork back then um you know and and the detailed information from where they got their parts i don't know that that would ever be so that's almost the perfect claim to make what organization would really admit yeah we repurpose parts from the hindenburg for our new dirigible right or hey we took parts of the titanic and we put it into a new ship who's ready to sail you know or or we're giving you a liver from somebody who died of brain cancer do you see what I'm saying? Right, right. You know, it, it's it's because you you brought up the the perfect term earlier, stigmatized. Yeah. So Eastern Airlines promoting it. Oh, by the way, we're repurposing these flights on this uh, on these parts from this flight that crashed. You know, people are going to think, well, how do I know that that's not the defective part? It's like uh, what was years ago the last episode of Friends where where Phoebe calls Rachel and says, um, I had a psychic flash. They don't have a phalange. And somebody sitting next to her hears the call. This plane doesn't have a flange, and everybody starts screaming, and they get off the plane before you know it, it leaves uh, leaves the runway. Okay, so so um, it's it's very easy to to spread fear by saying that oh this plane doesn't have this part, or it, the part came from a cursed flight full of uh, ghosts. But you know, Dave, there's nothing um, unusual. About about superstition uh, permeating vessels. There is a superstition about renaming ships. Um, it, it's, it's supposedly bad luck if if a boat or you know a ship has had its name changed, and uh, the superstition goes back centuries. In fact, there's a line in the book uh, Treasure Island where the character Long John Silver says, "What a ship was christened, so let her stay." And and um, because supposedly legend says that when every ship is christened, christened, in other words, named, its name goes into a ledger of the deep maintained by the god of the sea, uh, Poseidon or Neptune, however you know you want to perceive that, and that if you do rename a ship, there is actually a procedure 
uh, a ritual, a ceremony for doing that. So there's a lot of superstition that goes along with with uh, vessels and, and, and for transport, and Flight 401 brings that to light in many ways. Were the parts reused? You brought up a perfect point, Dave. I mean, what, what company is going to say that they did? Maybe they did do this, because let's face it, corporations, with all due respect to corporations, you know, the bottom line is the bottom line. Hey, okay, we know that this plane crashed because these guys weren't paying attention, but it had nothing to do with, you know, these parts, so let's use Use them, all right? And then all of a sudden, these ghost stories start coming up. Why would people on airplanes start saying, "I saw this guy," and then when they're showed pictures, "Yeah, that's him," they start seeing pictures of the captain and Don Repo. Why would people say, "Hey, Don Repo's face is looking at me out of the oven, and he just warned a fire," and then after the plane lands, its engine bursts into flames? So. Is there a conspiracy of people making this up, or did John Fuller, through exhaustive investigation, uncover stories, or did John Fuller make this all up? All right, I I have a big question for you, Mark Anthony, the medium, in just a few minutes. All right, Mark, as we talk about the, the Ghost of Flight 401, we've looked at the story, the history that we do know. The plane crashed. Over 90-some people passed passed away on this. Then, within a year, this, this story of these ghostly sightings start to appear. And, again, it's interesting because the author of the book is not allowed to legally name any of the people by name who was on board these flights that had these points because he didn't want to cost them their jobs. So he's got the perfect plausible deniability throughout this entire thing. It could be a well-crafted urban legend book. Or it could be exactly what it reports to be. People came forward and shared these stories. I would guess by 2018, some of these eyewitnesses had to have come forward, Mark. Well, the the one that, that really resonates with me, and her name is on record, is Faye Merriweather. And she was the flight attendant who was in the galley of a, of a flight that supposedly had uh, the repurposed uh, galley, or at least parts of it, and opens an oven and sees Don Repo's face looking out of it. And this is also verified by two other people, another um, flight attendant and uh, the flight engineer. So Faye Merriweather went on record using her name, and this is where the spirit of Don Repo said, watch out for fire on this plane. And then after the plane landed and it's uh, – um, one of its engines burst into fire. So that one, that's the hard one to overcome for the skeptics. You know, and the skeptics, there are some people that believe in the religion of nothing, and they're going to bend over backwards to negate and shoot down anything that is beyond their limited comprehension, their cynical view of reality, or the scope of their five physical senses. So while the skeptic certainly brings up some very valid points, I think the key to enlightenment is maintaining an open mind. Obviously right, and and, and kind of keeping that possibility open. Now, I said before the break that I was going to ask you, Mark Anthony, the medium, a pretty big question in this. As you're researching this, I know that you've got the abilities to turn on and off your... um, your abilities, or or maybe I shouldn't say turn them on and off, but to tone them down and focus on other things so that you're not constantly barraged by the, the supernatural. But as somebody who is a very logical thinker, somebody, and I know a lot of people are rolling their eyes, oh, right, the psychic lawyer is a logical thinker, but you are. You're one of the most intelligent guys I've ever met. You're well-spoken, well-educated, and a, a very uh, methodical thinker. When you are researching this story, what are you picking up spiritually from it? Do you believe that there is truth to the fact that these spirits continue to make their presence known? Yes. And, you know, I was, I always try to, when I go into uh, doing some research for a show, particularly your shows, because you ask really good questions, um, I got the feeling that there there's more to this than just urban legend, um, particularly with the incident with Faye Merriweather. Um, 
and and I've also in my work seen that spirits will intervene to warn people of things and then that there are certain places that seem to absorb vibration I you know I gotta tell a, a, a kind of a funny story when um, I was at the Tower of London a couple years back. I was by myself that day, and I was walking around, walking around, and it's you know it's really neat. It's the Tower of London. And I remember I sat down on this bench, and I was sitting there, and all of a sudden I started thinking about Anne Boleyn. That was one of Henry the Wives' eighth. Uh, she was the the one that caused all the controversy. He wanted to get divorced from his first wife, and and all this. And I go, why am I thinking of Anne Boleyn? And all of a sudden I get this chilly tingly feeling and i look to the left and down and there's a sign next to the bench i'm sitting on it was a glass sign it was engraved here be the spot queen anne boleyn was beheaded (laughs) and i started laughing and the thing is you know i'm I'm pretty good with history but and i i didn't know enough about anne boleyn i didn't realize that she was beheaded at the tower of london and then throughout the rest of the day i realized well that was the royal residence or one of them of henry the eighth Okay, um, I always thought the Tower of London is a negative thing. Well, it, part of it is because they got a prison there, but it was a royal residence. Okay, so is that spot cursed? Was I picking up on the vibration? Now, I approach uh, spirit communication through a science and physics uh, um um, perspective, and let's say, for the sake of argument, that parts were repurposed, so they're carrying the vibration of that event, and that vibration may have drawn the spirits to those particular planes. Or, if the parts had not been repurposed, perhaps part of the mission of these spirits, because spirits inform me that they're quite busy on the other side and they have tasks and things that they want to accomplish, perhaps part of the mission of what these spirits were doing was to help a profound change within the aircraft industry by, you know, saying there will never be another crash on an uh, L-1011, or I've done the pre-flight, or, hey, my face may be in the oven, but you need to watch out for fire on this flight. <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's very difficult for those of us who live in the finite material world to completely understand or even begin to understand the motives and objectives of immortal living spiritual beings. This, uh, you know, and, and I shared, as you heard in, in today's Theater of the Mind, my own experiences with these kind of warning or um, helpful spirits, as it were, the two different uh, kind of iterations of, of what occurred in my life. You know, how do we differentiate? I mean, in my case, both seem pretty obvious after the fact that I was dealing with something, in my opinion, very supernatural, um, which, you know... In in hindsight, I can say that at the times I would have never guessed it. Uh, you know, it just it seemed real to me in every aspect, every facet of the story. But how do we differentiate between these these moments of um, spiritual intervention? I don't want to call it angelic because I don't know that it always is. I, you know, it might just be the the loved ones or or another do gooder spirit that's that's trying to help out. My. My experience in spirit communication is that spirits are not here to harm us or frighten us, and nothing spiritual is controlling, but they can help guide us. Ultimately, we are responsible for our own actions and decisions, yet nothing is happen chance and there are no coincidences. And synchronicity is a series of events which lead to a particular um, outcome. And perhaps um, Flight 401 had to happen for maybe the same reason the Titanic did, because both of those disasters changed naval travel in in the uh, case of the Titanic, and then it completely changed um, air uh Air, aircraft procedures, uh, warning lights, things you know uh, of that nature, completely changed the aircraft industry. So we can look at Flight 401 as this is a horrible tragedy, but perhaps sometimes it is necessary to cut off a finger in order to save a hand. And in a karmic and synchronistic spiritual sense, these spirits were part of a greater plan being transmitted to us from, dare I say, God. Very cool. Very cool. What a, you know, it's an unsettling story in the sense that this tragedy took place. 
But the fact that there's this kind of calming effect of, of ghosts being seen, you know, and warning us and being there for us. Were many of the people that witnessed uh, the, the spirits from Flight 401, were they all just attendants and employees? Or were there um, were there people on board the plane, you know, just regular passengers that would report these claims as well? Well, yeah, there was uh, at least one report of a woman that panicked because uh, the officer that was sitting next to her that she identified right. later in a photo is Bob Law. So, yes, um, the the accounts that John Fuller targeted seem to be the Eastern employees, um, although supposedly there were lay people who saw them as well. I think it also is is nice to note that every – evening of December 29th, the, either the survivors or relatives of the survivors meet at that spot in the Everglades to hold a vigil for those who perished in Flight 401. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's like, I was, uh, you know, when I uncovered that, it's like, oh, I'd really, I, I kind of really like to go, um, not, not to be a gawker, but just, just out of respect. Well, let's. Uh, when is the date on that? December 29th. December 29th. Boy, calling it close to the holidays. I'll tell you what, Mark, if you ever want to take that trip, let me know, and I'd be happy to, to join you. I know it's a lot closer for you than it is for me, but I think it would be something powerful just to go be there and be a part of that moment and, and pay homage to uh, uh, a tragedy, the lives that were lost, and may, maybe the many lives that were saved by the interference and uh, – um, continued communication of these spirits. Who knows? This could be a army of darkness event at some point. Very cool. Well, Mark, I appreciate you joining us on this freaky Friday, the 13th and sharing your insights. It's always great to catch up on you. Uh, let people know what's going on with you. Where can they find you? What, what's going on in your world? Where can they see you next live? Oh, I've got a, a lot going on. If people visit my website, evidenceofeternity.com, um, I'll be um, conducting the Spirit Symposium, Love Never Dies, in Carlsbad, California, August 19th at the Hilton um, um, Garden Inn right on the ocean in Carlsbad. And I'll be working with my um, friend and colleague, Suzanne Wilson, fellow medium. We're going to be putting on a day of education and spirit communication. It's, it's an event not to be missed. I'll be speaking at the International Association Near-Death Studies in Seattle over Labor Day. I'll be at the Vail Symposium in in August. Um, I'll also be at the Afterlife Research Education Institute in Scottsdale in September. And um, coming up uh, shortly, I'll be at the Unity of Dallas uh, toward the end of July. And I'll be at Aquarian Dreams in Melbourne, Florida. Uh, we're doing a two, two night uh, the 18th and 19th uh, evening of spirit communication. So there's going to be several events throughout the year. And uh, please visit evidenceofeternity.com to keep up on uh, my hopping and popping uh, 2018 speaking tour. Well, that's it for this week, kids. We will be back next week with brand new adventures and exciting stories from all around the world with supernatural news and parashare and more of the best in paranormal talk radio. For Tim Dennis, I'm Dave Schrader. Thank you to Mark Anthony for joining us again today here on Beyond the Darkness. <laughs>